you don't know me, I'm Jim. I am one of your pastors here. And um, I work primarily with the middle school and high school students here, uh, which is a real blast. But uh, this past week, we spent the uh, entire week, we had three teams did six backyard Bible clubs. We were in Stapleton, we were out toward Hershey, and we were uh, in different areas around North Platte here. And well, we haven't actually tallied all the different numbers of the kids who showed up. You know, I was at, you know, clubs that had 20 or so kids, so I just kind of do the numbers, and we probably had 220 to 250 kids that we impacted throughout the course of the summer through our backyard Bible clubs. Uh, between what we did here regionally and then up in Thedford and Dunning earlier this summer. And the, the amazing thing um, happened, because as, as a youth pastor, you know, I get to talk to the kids all the time, and half the time their uh, you know, heads are down or they're exhausted because they've, you know, not been sleeping, but, you know, they're kids. Like, oh, I went to bed at 3 a.m. Get to bed earlier. I did, you know. And, and so, you know, you don't know if they're catching anything, and, and yet here they are by the end of the week sitting down with these kids and clearly communicating the gospel. We used uh, what we call the, the gospel ball. It was a soccer ball that had a whole bunch of different colors on it, all right? And so we used the wordless gospel to communicate the good news. It starts off with the yellow square on the, the not square, but pentagon on the, um, on the soccer ball. And we talk about how God is creator and how he created everything and it was perfect and, and he created us to be with him, and he loves us. And then we move to the black square, and it talks about how we sin, and we rebelled against God, and, and our sin requires payment. There was a punishment for it. And that, that punishment was death, and that there was no way that we could pay the price for our own sin and be back in relationship with God. There was nothing we could do. And then we move to the red patch. And the red patch in the soccer ball we t- talks about how God sent his son Jesus, because he loved us so much. He sent Jesus to live among us and to die on the cross for us. That paying the price for our sins, Christ died, was buried, and was raised on the third day. And then we turn to the, to the white. We talk about how if we place our faith and trust in Christ alone for our salvation, his payment for our sin washes that black away, and we are as white as snow. And, and the payment we couldn't pay, Christ has paid for us. And then we, we end up on the green, green patch, talking about how we need to then, because of what Christ has done for us, because he's changed us, we now need to grow in him. And, and growing looks a certain way. And so at the beginning of the week, we could barely keep the kids sitting down, right? By the end of the week, the, the, the little kids are, are like just sitting there wanting to hear every word the teens are saying as they so carefully and methodically work them through the truth of the gospel. And I'm thinking, wow, it's really cool to see because when you sit there at youth group or on Sunday morning, I'm not sure you're getting anything. And, and here, now that you're telling it to somebody else, I get a chance to see. You actually are understanding some of the things we're teaching you. So I tell you that story because um, I get the privilege of coming up here this morning not to convince you of something you don't already know, but to convince you, uh, not really convince you, but to remind you of what you do know, right? I I don't want to teach you a a new truth. What I want you to do is I want you to go, oh, yeah, yeah, he's not telling me anything new. So so that's my goal this morning. So as you you know, if you've been with us this summer, we're in a series called Kingdom Identity. Um, And in this series so far, we've talked about how uh, God reveals himself to us, not by what he does, but by who he is. Right, so God is creator, and so he reveals himself as, as, as creator, because he, he, he creates, but being someone who creates doesn't make him creator. Being creator allows him to create, okay? So God also reveals himself to us as father. He is father. He is the one who gave us all life. Just revealing himself to us as father doesn't make him father. Who he is makes him father, and because he's father, we're children, okay, God's children, and together we're brothers and sisters, which makes us family, right? Family is a real important thing. That's why we take this time to talk during church, because it's time for us to connect as family and practice something that we really should be doing everywhere else we go. 
Um, yesterday, I, I took a, a brief trip to the farmer's market to grab a couple things, and I ran into some family. And, and then I went over to Happy Hearts, and I ran into some more family. And it's just like, I love North Platte because you run into family everywhere you go. Last night, we went to Gothenburg, went to a play, ran into more family. It's, it's fun because, because there's family everywhere we go when we realize that family isn't just who lives in our household, but it's everybody who comes underneath God as Father and has placed their faith and trust in Christ. And we can connect with family everywhere we go. We've also learned, um, Pastor Brett last week talked about how Jesus Christ reveals himself to us as king. Okay, and as king, we are his servants. And he actually came as a servant king. So not only you know, are we just servants of the king, but, but our king himself showed us how to serve. And so we serve our king. And so today we're going to talk about what does that really look like to live out being servants of the king. For starters, it starts with our identity. Romans 8, 14 through 17 says this, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Now, notice that last line there, that we may suffer with him. That's not really fun, huh? Like, no one likes to talk about suffering, right? But it says here that we might suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I like the glorified part, not so much the suffering part, but check out what this really says to us. Our new identity in Christ is so wrapped up with who Jesus Christ is that we are going to suffer with him and be glorified with him. Okay, that's hard for me even to get my mind around to to think that not only did God send his son to us, but he's so given me something that wasn't there to start with that I am... I am so intimately wrapped up with who Christ is in my identity that I'm going to suffer with him and be glorified with him. I'm never going to be like him because he's God, but he's given me this new identity that is so different than the one I started off with, and we'll talk more about that later. Now, again, last week, Brett showed us that Jesus is our king, and as our king and us as servants, it requires a response. <clears throat> Excuse me. John 15, 7 through 11 says this. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Now, Again, notice this. This is talking about our identity. Our identity is that we belong to Christ as Christ belongs to the Father. Well, we think about the Trinity. We can't separate Jesus from the Father. He is fully God, fully man. And somehow now I am fully Jim, but fully Christ's, okay? I no longer belong to myself, but I belong fully to who Jesus is. And so much so that my obedience is no longer to gain his favor, right? I, my obedience is service to my king. And, and Jesus says, look, I served my father by obeying him. You serve me by obeying me. And what's the result? You remain, I remain in his love, you remain in my love. And my joy is going to make your joy full. So my new identity is so wrapped up in Christ again that because he has joy, I am filled with his joy. That just blows my mind because so much of my life, I think I'm in control. This is, this is my life, my identity. But no, God has given us a new identity that is so much wrapped up in who Jesus is that, that even my, my joy, it's not mine, it's Christ's. And, and it fills me up. Jesus served his father and showed us what it's like to serve, serve him. Now, there's two pictures that we looked at last week. <clears throat> And, and one of my friends in the first service came to me and says, you know, I totally got lost in the first service because you didn't tell us where it was and it was in a completely different gospel than you were preaching out of. So please give us the reference so I don't have to spend so much time. So if you're one of those guys who likes to look it up, if you weren't here last week, the first, um, the first picture is the picture of Jesus at Cana. 
Um, this was before his public ministry. We find this in John chapter 2. There was a wedding celebration, and they ran out of wine. And Mary comes to Jesus and says, hey, they ran out of wine, and, and apparently there was some understanding that because Mary told Jesus they ran out of wine that she expected him to do something about it, and so he did. And he takes these, you know, about 120 gallons worth of water and turns it into wine, and when it's tasted, it's not just junky wine, it's actually really, really, really good wine. It's like the best wine. And, but Jesus doesn't do it, so everybody goes, hey, you're Jesus, son of God, oh, wow. Nope, Jesus just does it and kind of disappears out of, out, of, out, of, out of the limelight. He's serving not really the celebration, but he's serving his father, but in doing so, he's bringing better wine, and it enhances the celebration of everybody around him. The second picture was Jesus' last celebration here on earth. It was his last Passover. He's in Jerusalem by the temple somewhere. They're celebrating the Passover feast. He walked into Jerusalem a week earlier with about 350 of his disciples, of his followers, along with the main 12 that we normally read about. And, and they went in and <clears throat> the, the larger group dispersed and Jesus is in an upper room with the 12 disciples and probably a few others. And something's overlooked and we find this story in John chapter 13 where somehow the foot washing was overlooked. And so Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, God himself takes off his outer clothing, wraps a towel around his waist, and begins to wash the dirt and the poop, yeah, because, you know, animals, you know, that's it's what it's like, off the feet of the disciples. This is the lowliest servant's job. And he's not doing it <clears throat> in front of the crowds that are out there in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, or even his hundreds of, of disciples and followers that came into Jerusalem with him, but just this small group. He's doing it not, not to get attention, not to draw attention to himself, but because he's serving his father. And he's showing us how to serve. And we call this bringing the towel when we serve God, not others, in the lowliest way. And we'll take a look at some ways to do that specifically later. But <clears throat> our focus here this morning, I really want us to see, is on identity. Um, again, I don't really want to try to convince you that, hey, you need to go out and serve, all right? What I want to do is I want to remind you of who you are. In Christ, you are servants of the King, right? You're servants of the King. If, if you don't get anything out of this morning's message other than, you know, that guy was talking and he said a lot of things, but, you know, all he did was really remind us that, you know, I'm in Christ and I'm a servant of the King, that's fine with me. If you get nothing else out of this morning's message, it's that your identity is a servant of the king, all right? How you live out that identity, we'll talk about here in just a few minutes, but I want you to get this really importantly because when we start talking about what servants do, it's real easy to become, you start thinking like it's a to-do list, like, oh, if I do these things, then I'm a servant of the king. No. You're a servant of the king. The question is, are you an active servant of the king or not, right? It's not going to change who you are. You're going to be a servant of the king no matter what. So I want you to understand this um, as we go into our main passage here in Matthew 25. Um, you're going to find it on page 831 of the Pew Bible, or the Chair Bible. Um, I'm going to be reading out of the ESV if you want to follow along. If you have a little app device, you can do that. But thanks. <clears throat> not enough caffeine in my system. <clears throat> um, but otherwise, I do want to let you know that if you don't have a Bible of your own, those Bibles in the chair are for you to take so you have a copy of God's Word with you. <clears throat> I used to work at REI. I, I did for a couple years. And there's a difference between identity and activity. People would come into REI, and, and you could tell those people who smelled like they were outdoors people. I mean, there was those that, that really smelled like outdoors people, and you're like, you know, you've been outdoors too long. But there were the ones that, you know, just kind of had this, like, you know, they walked in, and they kind of knew what the gear was, and knew, you could tell they knew what they were doing. And then there were other people that looked like they belonged behind a computer desk, right? Not outdoor people at all. We were down in the Austin area, Dell's down there, um, Apple's down there, and, and so there was a lot of computer guys that didn't know anything about going outside, but, but they, were, they were working pretty high-powered jobs. This dad comes into REI on a Wednesday evening and says, hey, I want to take my family camping this weekend. We're going to go, you know, you know, out to the lake and go camping. So at a campground, I'm like, okay, that's pretty safe. That's a good first step because you don't look like you know anything about camping. What gear do you already have? He goes, I have nothing. Okay, 
All right, so let's get your basic list out because we had lists. So we can go through and make sure you don't miss anything. You need to go camping out by the lake. <clears throat> Literally three cartloads and thousands of dollars later, he is checking out. Okay? He does not know what he's doing. But he has all the right gear. All right? Monday morning, he shows back up. It rained horribly that weekend. In Texas, when it rains, it's kind of like here, just it's like a beautiful day, and then all of a sudden it's like, who dumped a bucket on us? And you get these big raindrops falling everywhere, and everything gets flooded out because it's all rock. <clears throat> he didn't come back to return any of the stuff. He came back for help putting it back in its packages. Like, he had soaking wet sleeping bag still and, and a wet tent, and we, so we had to train him on how to, how to hang the stuff up and dry it out. I mean, he didn't know what he was doing. He had all the right tools to have a great camping experience, but he didn't know what he was doing with them. And as a result, he was back in the store for more training the following, the following week. You know, I want you to see this because we're going to start talking about some things that describe servants of the king, the right tools, but those tools don't make us servants, right? What makes us a servant of the king? starts with an I. It's identity. It's who we are. It's because Christ gave us a new identity. We're servants of the king. So when we talk about these things, this can't become a to-do list, all right? And you're going to see why. So let's look at Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. <clears throat> this is the parable of the sheep and the goats. Jesus has been talking to his disciples about what is to come, and he, and he concludes this passage, this section with this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from, the, from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I'm going to pause there. Notice what he's saying. It's really important. Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. All right, this isn't come and do these things so you will be blessed by my Father. This isn't even I separated you over here to sheep and now you're blessed. Okay, this is identity. We are blessed. But, but what does it mean that we're blessed, okay? Go back to the gospel ball that I was talking about. Remember, God created us to be in relationship with him. And then because of our rebellion against God, our want for sin, we chose to find our identities with ourselves as king of us. In our brokenness, in our rebellion, we chose to find our identities right here. Yet then God loved us so much that he didn't leave us here, but sent his son Jesus so that we could have a new identity. And by placing our faith and trust in Christ alone and what he did on the cross for us for salvation, we get a brand new identity. We are no longer identified by our brokenness and by our rebellion against God, but we are identified by his son, the very life that he raised from the dead. He raised us with Christ. And our life is now hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. That is who we are. That is our identity. We are blessed by the Father. That is who we are. That is our identity. So listen to these things through the ears of identity, through the eyes of identity. In verse 35, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Their actions are so much a part of who they are. But they didn't even recognize that they were serving the king. It's just, it's, it's like when you 
you know, get up to get ready in the morning. You don't really think about all the things that you need to do because you've done it so many times that you just do it. It's just who you are. It's just what you do. Feeding the hungry, the thirsty, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and imprisoned are so much a part of what those who follow Christ do that these things identify not their activity but their identity. <clears throat> if I was to ask you, to those of you who've been around North Platte, if you were to see somebody who was wearing a, a short little skirt and sweater and had some blue and yellow on it and a little NP on the, the vest and they were walking around with pom-poms, what would I be describing? Specifically from where? North Platte High Cheerleader, right? But if I put on a short little skirt and vest with an NP on it, walked around with pom-poms, would you go, oh, he's a cheerleader? No, you'd say he's creepy, <laughs> right? So apparently the outfit doesn't define who's in the outfit. The cheerleader wears the cheerleader outfit because they're a cheerleader. If I wore the cheerleader outfit, I'd be imprisoned and you'd have to come visit me, all right? <clears throat> so here, all these things don't make the person a servant of the king, the person's already a servant of the king, and these activities are basically their outfit, okay? But let's go on. Let's take a look at what else happens here. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and the angels. Okay, so again, Jesus isn't saying at the end time what's going to happen. Here's the sheep, here's the goats. You're going to be blessed and you're going to be cursed. He's not cursing them at that point. They're already cursed. Why are they cursed? Think about it. The black panel on the, on the gospel ball talks about how we rebelled against God and everybody who's made their identity, their sin and their rebellion against God and their brokenness, I can't think of any more significant cursing than to curse someone to say, make yourself the king of your own life and live only for yourself. There is nothing so hollow, so empty, so disconnected from life than to find one's identity only in their broken heart. So what Jesus is saying is they're already cursed. And, and this is what happens to those who are cursed. They are cast out. They are sent away from the one who gives life. Now, I don't know if you noticed on the way in, but we have a wall out here that has a whole bunch of names on it. Maybe you've written a name on it. These are names of people that don't yet know Christ. These are names of people that need to know Jesus, that need to not have their identity founded in their sin and rebellion against God, but need to be given a new identity by placing their faith and trust in Christ alone and repenting from their sin, all right? And so we've been praying for these people. And, and if you haven't written a name out down there yet and you know somebody who needs Jesus, I encourage you to write their name on the way out today. But what I want to do right now is I want to take a minute and pause and just silently in your heart, I want you to pray for the name you wrote on the wall or for the name of somebody you know who needs Jesus who doesn't yet know them. Let's pray. Those whose identity is not in Christ, those who have not yet responded to the good news of the gospel, then I will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who you cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. 
Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. I know all of us here know people who don't know Christ, yet who do good things. All right, we have organizations across our country and around the world that do good things. Some were started by people who don't know Christ. They, they know their own need and tried to meet that need in others. So what's the difference here? Well, when Jesus, our King, came to serve, he didn't serve himself, he served the Father. When Jesus, our King, came to serve, he didn't serve because everybody else was serving, right? When Jesus, our King, came to serve, he didn't serve to fill a personal need or get attention for himself. He came to serve his Father. He didn't serve his own agenda, he served his Father's agenda. There are a lot of people out there who serve, but it's not just serving the least of these. See, when we serve God through others, we still serve God. When we serve others through ourself, we still serve ourselves. But that's our identity. It comes back to it. If we are saved by Christ and our identity is given to us by Christ, when we serve God, we serve God. If we are still our own God and we go to help others, we are still serving ourselves. And there are people all over this world who are dying to serve themselves because they've never, never humbled themselves to God and accepted what Jesus has done for them. So significant, the actions do not define the person. Our identity defines us. Amen? Yeah, that's an exciting thing because you know what? Jim's identity stinks. Christ's identity in Jim, that's amazing. That's exciting. That's something to get up and worship God for, okay? Because what Christ can do in Jim, oh, there is no limit. What Jim can do for Jim, oh my gosh, that's just a pit that leads down to the grave. So how do we live this out? What do we do? What does it mean to bring better wine as we serve our king in the lives of others? What does it mean to bring the towel as we serve our king in the lives of others? Well, serving our king is... Letting the Holy Spirit show us where he is already working in different lives, in different areas, and accepting his invitation to join him in what he's doing, All right? This is, this is important because if we let him, the Holy Spirit, set the agenda and the timeline, right, then we are joining him in his service. If we set the agenda and the timeline, then we're asking him to join us, right? Well, who's God here? The Holy Spirit is, right? Who joins who? We join him. We don't ask him to join us. That's hard, right? Because that's really humbling. We have to make sure all the time that we are submissive to God and not running back and trying to come up with some pseudo me in charge Christian identity, that my identity is from Christ, and I'm letting him set the agenda, set the timeline. Serving our king is bringing the reality of the gospel to real needs. Serving our king is intentionally living our identity in our everyday lives. Our identity is family because God is our father, and our identity as servants because Jesus, our brother, is also our king. So not only do we serve with him, but we always serve under him. This is his story. This is his agenda, and it's going to happen in his timeline. Has anybody ever seen somebody try to share Christ and they're really pushy? 
like really pushy. Like that's, that's where we get hit Christ's agenda, but we're using our timeline, right? Do people usually like that? No. Who saves somebody? Do we? No, we don't. Who saves somebody? Jesus. Jesus, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, and, and Jesus saves us. I mean, it's, 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 you can't separate from the Trinity because, I mean, God forgives all our sins and raises us up with Christ. And I mean, it's, oh my gosh, is it so wonderful, right? That it's not us. It's not us. And, and sometimes we really have to suffer with a, with a timeline that, that we don't like. I mean, you know people who, who you've been praying for for years and they're still enemies of God? Yeah. I mean, Mara on her, her mission trip, uh, the kind of her host couple there in, in Nairobi, the Muslims, right? They've been bringing missionary teams from Liberty University for decades, right? Because it benefits their country. Yet, even though they've heard the gospel over a hundred times, they're still God's enemy. Wouldn't it be great if we could set it on our timeline, timeline just go over there and convince them of the gospel and, and that they would turn to God? But it's God's timeline. It's his story. It's his agenda. And it happens when he makes it happen, not when we make it happen. And so we have to be patient and, and partner with God. And, and, and unfortunately, that makes life messy because we deal with all these expectations that aren't met and relationships and, and people. And sometimes we just have to get down and in the dirt and serve people the way Christ served people. And, and, and maybe we won't ever see the fruit of that service. But then again, it's not our story. It's not about us. It's about serving our king. It's about him. It's his agenda, his timeline, his story, his glory, his kingdom forever and ever. And he's invited us to join him and made it possible that we can. But what does it look like to really bring the better wine and the better towel to our everydays, our everyday lives? Remember the four rhythms I talked about? Blessing, bringing God's love to other people, eating together and sharing our common need, um, listening to others and listening to God or listening to God and others, and then enjoying one another, all right? Let's take a look at how we can serve, live out our identity as servants of the king in these four rhythms of our life. All right, the first one, bless. Another one of those tough verses in the Bible, Matthew 5, 41. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Wait, wait. So if someone asks you to carry a piano, carry two pianos? Yeah, I mean, I mean <laughs> wait a second. Wait, I just can't serve a little bit. I got to give it all. You know, I got, I got to go more than they expect, but that's, 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 bringing the, that's bringing the towel, that's doing what's not expected, that's not serving the, the, the need, because I'm not serving the need, I'm serving God, I'm serving the King of Kings, and, and whatever he asks me to do, that's what I do, not what the person in front of me asks me to do. I mean, it's, it's as simple as this, when you, when you go to open the door to let somebody through, and then you see like a crowd after them, and you're like going, oh, I was going to let that person through the door, and oh, now I... Now I've got to let, kind of hold the door for everybody. And by the f fifth person coming through, they're like, are you the doorman? I might as well be, right? But wait a second, I'm not serving you. I'm serving the king. I'm doing this not so that you can think that I'm something, but so that you can think that God's something. And, and so instead of giving up and letting go of the door and going on your own agenda, you go, God, what's your agenda here? I can't tell you how many times it's been like the seventh or eighth person through the door and I spark up a conversation with them. And... Either I, I find another family member or I find somebody that I can encourage toward Christ. It's cleaning a messy bathroom, even when it's not your bathroom and your mess, right? That's like gross, isn't it? You don't want to clean up somebody else's mess in the bathroom. It's picking up somebody else's litter at the park. You know, you're taking your stuff, you're being responsible, but why do those guys leave that stuff there? And it's like, I'm not even going to have that conversation, I'm just going to pick it up and take care of it because I'm not serving them or myself, I'm serving my king. It's cleaning the kitchen when you're only asked to unload the dishwasher. Guys, how many of your wives would be happy if you did that? 
right? Seriously, you guys do unload the dishwasher, right? Um, yeah, it's going that extra mile. It's helping somebody else when it doesn't help you at all, all right? That is bringing the towel as servants of our king. Eating together, we share, among, share our common need. Now, I hate calling people out. No, I don't, not at all. But I was, I was at a barbecue this past week. Um, the Matuzaks moved from in town out, out of town just a little ways. And he had a big crew of people come to help him. And I got to tell you, you know, if Dale would have thrown hot dogs on the grill, and they would have gotten eaten. Like, everybody would have been satisfied. It was a hot day. It was a hungry day. And any food would have been fine. But he didn't just throw hot dogs on a grill to feed people. No, he had Todd Chambers bring his trigger grill out and, and had Todd cook ribeye steaks for everybody. And some of those steaks were aged over three weeks. So we're talking like the best ribeye steaks I think I've ever had, okay? And this is what he, I mean, some of these, some of the teens that were there like ate three steaks. I mean, they would have just been fine eating hot dogs. I'm not sure they tasted them, right? But, but he brought better wine to serve those. He didn't just, it wasn't just about meeting the need. It was about going that extra mile, going above and beyond and, and, and being generous and, and serving not those really who were there. He was really serving his king. That's better wine. That's bringing donuts to work when you don't even eat donuts, right? Or bringing, you know, gluten-free paleo bites to work when you don't eat gluten-free paleo bites. Hint, hint. Um, that's bringing your favorite coffee or tea or sparkling water to share with your coworkers and just keeping the fridge stocked so they, they, they know that it's there for them and they don't understand why you're willing to do that, right? Because you're not serving them. You're serving your king. You're bringing better wine. That's expanding your shopping list just a little so you have an extra meal in the pantry or the freezer so you, you can always invite somebody over. Um, here's something we used to do in bigger cities, but it works here too. You buy McDonald's gift cards or, or a fast food restaurant gift card, and when you see somebody in need, uh, you don't hand them money, you hand them the gift card for the restaurant. Now, it's not what you think. It's not so you can control how they're using the, their money, but what we found, especially in Chicago, <clears throat> is if you give five, ten dollars to somebody who's obviously living on the streets, and they walk into McDonald's, the staff will kick them out even if they have money, right? But if they have a McDonald's gift card, they can't kick them out because they've got McDonald's tender. And in the summer, it gives them AC and access to a bathroom. In the winter, it gives them heat and access to a bathroom. It gives them more than just a meal, but it takes care of other needs. It's in many ways bringing better wine to the situation. It's, it's even if you don't, get the opportunity to eat with them, but sometimes we've even like said, hey, come on, we'll buy, you, we'll buy you food. Listening. We listen to God and others. We're always listening, and what's the loudest voice? People like to know they are being listened to. Do you take time to be quiet and listen? Maybe you have a friend or a coworker that, that it's hard to listen to them, and, and they're always talking, and, and you know that they want to be listened to, but don't serve them, serve your king. Let Jesus set the agenda for your time with them. Let Jesus set the timeline for your time with them. Listen to them. Let them know that they're being listened to. You can bring the towel as you let somebody know they are valuable to God simply by listening to them. And enjoying, and this is intentionally celebrating with others. Now, Megan keeps a box of cards at home and, and I don't use them because words really, written words aren't my thing. I like spoken words. I don't know if you can tell. I like to talk a lot, you know. I have to watch the time. I've got 55 seconds left, right? You know, I, I'm that type of person. She likes to write, right? And so she always has a box of cards that she can pull out and write a card to celebrate somebody or encourage somebody or doing something like that. And she keeps that box constantly rejuvenated so that she always has those cards so she can, she can enjoy somebody with a, with a card, um, you know, guys, guys, I've seen about this one. Any competitive guys out here? Any guys who are competitive? You know, right? Anybody have competitive friends? All right, yeah, competitive friends. Yeah, so I know there's some out here. Go do something that your friend is better than you at, and as they're beating you, celebrate them. Get excited for them. Enjoy the fact that they are doing well instead of being all grumpy that you're not beating them or you're not doing all that well, all right? Do, I mean, that's, that's the way we can enjoy each other. 
Um, if, you're, if you're a foodie like me, buy dessert for the whole table, especially if it's a restaurant you normally go to and you know there's desserts that you like. Get a couple extra of those desserts so that everybody can share and enjoy the dessert that you enjoy together. That is bringing better wine to the celebration. Bringing the towel and bringing the better wine, serving our king out of our identity, not out of our obligation, this is bringing the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ to our everyday lives. The reason Jesus could, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, say, you fed the hungry and clothed the naked and visited those who were sick and in prison is because that was the outfit the followers of God, those who were identified by God, wore. Everyone around him knew that if people did these things, they did them because they followed God. As we live out our identity as servants of the king, a lot of people are going to get served and they're going to feel the love of God through our actions. But even more so, they are going to recognize the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ because we will be identified by our actions, by our love for others. Let's pray. Father God, as we attempt to live out our identity that you have given us, as your servants, as we attempt to bring the towel and to bring the better wine. Father, we can so easily fall into the trap of trying to be identified by what we do. Remind us daily of our identity in you. And then help us hear your voice and respond to you so that everything we do comes from who we are as we bring the reality of the gospel, as we bring the better wine, as we bring the towel into the world around us. Use us to change many lives. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.